Welcome into the KSO show. I am Mason Both joined by KSU underscore fan and Drew Galloway. It is a Sunday, which means it is the Sunday show as we continue to get through this first full weekend of the college football season. A couple games left. I mean, we're in the middle of one as we're recording this and then another one on Monday. But for the most part, week one is in the books, taken care of, and uh, a good time to remind everybody that K-State will not start their football season in week one next year. They will start it in week zero. The Wildcats are headed to Dublin to Ireland next August for the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. Join your Wildcats by booking your getaway at cats2ireland.com. The best seats and hotels will go fast, so secure your package now. That's cats, the number two, ireland.com. That is August 23rd, week zero, the very first college football game of the 2025 season between K-State and Iowa State. So cats2ireland.com to get hooked up there. All right. Uh, let's get into it. K-State, 41-6 to winners over UT Martin to start their season. It was a game of mixed results. You could make whatever conclusions you wanted from this game, and uh, certainly the the people in the, uh, the K-State Facebook groups have done that. I'm sure there were a wide range of opinions, probably a lot of very over-positive people that say, we should never criticize these fine young men. Uh, and then everybody else that wanted to burn it down and uh, probably say something about guys making money now and how that's a problem. So uh, where do you guys fall on what took place yesterday against UT Martin? Drew, I'll let you start with just your general takeaways from the game. Honestly, it, it was kind of like I expected it to go. Like I remember uh, talking with fan at halftime, like, there were expected growing pains. It's the second youngest starting quarterback in K-State history. It's a first time offensive play caller. It's a pretty solid FCS team. I mean, UT Martin is still like probably not on that same level as like the North Dakota State, South Dakota States of the world, but they're fine. It's not like they played like a Furman or like a Lindenwood, Lindenwood, or an Avalon. Right, real Christian quick, I, I've always had this problem. Uh, whoever's making the football schedules, why can't they find these teams to come to K State? <laughs> why is it that every time it seems they're coming in here, it's like, well, you know, these guys, they won their FCS conference last year. They're going to be, you know, preseason top twenty-five. They're going. Who is making these decisions? Who is making these idiotic decisions? Go find Lindenwood or Furman or whoever that I see get beat by a thousand every single year. I, I always wonder this or like, I mean, such an idiotic decision that K-State's playing army next year. We know how much these coaches hate playing the service academies because it does zero good for them to play them. Like you're not recruiting against these guys and they're going to run some archaic form of offense that you're going to have to devote way too much time to trying to learn how to stop for it to never be relevant the rest of the year uh, there are many examples of this. I just wonder, does everybody else feel like this around college football, or is this a specific to K-State thing where you just go, there are easier opponents to find out there. Go and get them. I, I know Bill Snyder would. <laughs> I think that there are easier opponents out there, obviously, but I, I don't know if I would I don't know if I would feel better or the same if they won 77 nothing yesterday or if they were, or if they won 41 to 6 like they, they took care of business and there were growing pains <coughs> but they were to be expected and the defense was really really good and, and special teams was kind of up and down a little bit but you could see the flashes so I, i'm not like overly concerned and not like willing to burn it down or be overly positive because it was kind of about what i expected like i still had like 49 to 3 was my score prediction like the game kind of went how I anticipated. Yeah, I, I would I would say um, offense was I I thought there would be growing pains, but I don't know if I suspected one score in the first four drives with an interception and two three and outs. So that that was probably a little below what I would would hope to start the season. It kind of got going eventually, and you know finished out the game strong. So. Pleased with that. Defense was dominant. You know, really one mistake when when time mattered, um, and then you know they were able to put the game away. You know, but you are in a situation where to start the third quarter, 
UT Martin is threatening to make it a one-score game after the fumbled kickoff return. But then at the same time, we're in garbage time one minute into the fourth quarter as well. So, you know, they, they finished out the third quarter they needed the way they needed to to make it work out. I, I kind of agree with Drew on special teams. You're happy to hit those two field goals. We had two punts down inside the 20, um, blocked a punt for a score, of course. We, we all remember that play. Um, but then you, you you let a punt roll, lose probably 20 yards of field position uh, on that. So ups and downs, good and bad, fumble to kickoff return. You know, you never want to see a turnover on a, on a special teams play. So I would say <clears throat> defense, I would grade highly. Offense, um, lower, more like average, and then special teams, depending on the unit, somewhere in between. Yeah, it's uh... – it was just, and it was a weird game flow. Like I, I will, I will give that. I mean, UT Martin. I think Drew said to me at one point in the third quarter uh, about how odd it was to see them so persistent that they wanted to run the ball when it was clearly not working. And what that led to was UT Martin for a good chunk there, uh, basically had K State doubled up in possession time for a lot of the game. K- that that evened out a little bit more later on because K-State went certainly like the Roberson drive and Knuth, like those were a little bit uh, longer and even some of the the others. But um, K-State still lost possession 33-30 to 36-22, uh, but dominated everywhere else. The other thing that also hurt K-State was the fact that, um, yes, in the first half, the offense hit it to themselves, but then you come out of the gates in the second half and it the fumble by Jace Brown and everything – uh, so all just it, it added up to a very very strange uh, type of night, and I, I guess we'll see uh, how things look against Tulane this weekend. I'm going uh, and and taking a quick little peek at uh, how things ended up playing out, and I want to compare these to to last year uh, and and how things went because it is interesting to think. I mean, K State beat Semo 45 to nothing last year. They beat. UT Martin 41 to six this year, UT Martin manhandled SEMO last year. So UT Martin was the better team uh, than, than SEMO. And you would think that they'll probably do it again this year because they're in the same league and, and UT Martin brings back a lot on offense and their UT Martin's defense was better than I expected last night. I, I think K-State contributed to some of that. Um, but there was also some, some high praise uh, from Chris Kleiman and others about the UT Martin defense um, while I, I get to, to one other thing, fan, I'll ask you this. Um, when it comes to the way that Connor Riley debuted in his first game as the offensive coordinator full time, like the job is his, not auditioned down in Orlando, what did you make of how he handled that first half of football? Because I think, you know, I came up at halftime and I was like, where, where is the blame pie for the offense right now? How much is on Avery? How much is on Riley and how much is on these receivers? So what did you make of Connor Riley? I, I thought there was um, – there's an insistence. There's, there seemed to be an insistence on throwing the ball in the first half. I think the play calls were nearly split, 14-13 or something like that, as far as pass calls, run calls. And I think two of those runs technically were pass calls that turned into scrambles by Avery Johnson. So there seemed to be – uh, emphasis to to try to establish throwing the ball, to not call quarterback runs, and to run the ball a couple different ways with with DJ Giddens mainly, and then throwing in Dylan Edwards. So I I don't know, <clears throat> you know, obviously they're they're game planning to win the game, but I do think there was a little bit of game planning to see what Avery could do as well in the passing game, especially, and to see what the wide receivers could do in the passing game, and I think. Um, when you limit your possessions, you only have five possessions in the first half and really eight what I would consider possessions before you're in garbage time. You don't have a lot of opportunities, 40-some plays. Um, so that really limits your your pool of data to really evaluate what you guys, what your team did. And then the second half, I think we just said, hey, let's let's come and run it. I think the, the second half splits were like 12-3 run run before garbage time happened and uh, the run game was successful. I mean, we ran the ball really well. I think that over nine yards per carry and a 70% uh, 
success rate. And yes, I'm going to call the new jet sweep where we push it forward and it's a pass. That is a run in my book. I'm not going to call it a pass. Uh, the one to the one to Jaden Jackson, and I couldn't tell necessarily on the field, but I still felt like they probably it was technically a pass, but they counted it as a run in the stats. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, I and I guess Keegan Johnson's too. They did, uh, I believe. Yeah, they did. So, um, yeah. So they, you know, that that's something of note, I guess. Uh, if you're looking for that, here's what I'll I'll bring up to take us back to kind of comparing how things went uh, last season and how uh, you you look at the way these games were handled against SEMO. And this is actually, it lines up pretty perfectly. So in both this year's game against UT Martin and last year's game against SEMO, the starting quarterback got eight series. 2023, K-State with the starters, five touchdowns, one field goal, one pick, one punt. The difference in there, they started first drive, touchdown, then the second drive, people will probably remember Will aired it out there, and it was like that's a classic Will Howard throw right there. Uh, that was a pick. But then they ripped off four straight touchdown drives to end the first half, and so they were in full control of that game at halftime. They came out, and in the second half, field goal and then punt for Will Howard's last drive out there with the starters. This year for K-State against UT Martin, three touchdowns, two field goals, Two punts, one pick. The difference being that in the first half, it was punt, touchdown, pick, punt, field goal, and then they come out field goal, touchdown, touchdown. So the last four drives, they did get points on, and I would also argue that, you know, in terms of, I think Riley had some things going on decision-wise that they were like, we want to try and do this early in the game. Chris Kleiman has shown at times in his career to be a guy that isn't going to really force an issue and I thought early on in the game last night they probably could have maybe it was even that first drive where they were you know like fourth and three fourth and four around midfield so what it ended up being something along those lines I mean they were close to midfield I thought that maybe they should have gone for it. yeah it was fourth and four at their own 46 I personally in that type of game I would have gone for it right there because I do think you want to have kind of that momentum and energy and you don't want this narrative to already kind of start to develop and everything. Uh, but I understand why he did that because as I laid out, and this is why they punted again the other time and why they did some of the things they did, they had already seen the UT Martin punter have a bad punt. And then later in the game, they blocked a punt. And so they were probably sitting there thinking, we can win this this field position battle. And it was clear early that UT Martin was not going to score on the K-State defense. So they they played it smart. But ultimately, if you want to go and look at what transpired, it's not apples to apples. But for the most part, um, last year's team and this year's team, similar in a lot of areas and and not a lot of deviation from one or the other. So it looks, it looks and feels worse. But at the end of the day, this year's team with the starters out there, uh, they went out and they got you 27 points last year's team. They got you 38 points. Um, but also this year's team. And I, I said this to drew people treat it a little bit differently. If Colby McAllister just grabs that ball and falls on it at the one yard line. And then you have a one play, one touchdown drive. And so then it's like, Oh, you know, two of your first three possessions are touchdown touchdown with the punt versus going punt, touchdown, interception. It's it's kind of a perception thing. Um, and that's not saying that it would be right us talking about it that way, but that is just how it would be talked about. And it kind of highlights that this is all narrative-based at times. And it's a good sign that they bounce back in those last four drives that the starters got. They got their field goals. And I think what we saw in the second half is a lot more like what we're going to see from the K-State offense this year. Um, where I think they decided, okay, we, we didn't want to kind of expose everything and we wanted to try and work on what we needed to work on, but we do need to go put this game away and not have people lose confidence in us. So I think they did a good job uh, by the end of it, but I don't get the warm and fuzzies from that game, and uh, it's going to be up to what they do against Tulane to kind of dictate that moving forward. You need a better Avery Johnson performance uh, in week two against the Green Wave. Well, I was even going to say that you said similar in a lot of areas to last year, and 
you probably played a better team this year. So like that, if you add that in too, like you should probably feel a little bit better. And, and I even think that the perception changes if Avery Johnson doesn't throw that interception. I mean, that, that's a drive that Casey mm -hmm. was driving and then about to approach the red zone and then threw an interception. Like you get points on that drive. I think that the perception totally changes about how the offense looked too. And, and that's a pass that, I don't think that that's a mistake that Avery Johnson will make again because of what we were talking before we started recording. DJ Giddens was never really open. Then he just kind of forced the issue. And if that ball is caught, I don't know if DJ Giddens is like gets up from it because there were three guys surrounding him in that area. So I think that all in all, like you probably played a better team than you did last year. And you have a lot more new pieces on this team than you had last year coming into the season opener. So I think that this is kind of what you expected. Uh, the one positive, like really positive about uh, the K-State offense uh, that I don't think that we have like lined up to talk about. The offensive line was really, really good for most of the game yesterday. Avery Johnson, I think, only got hit once uh, passing, and they were able to run the ball with authority. Yeah, the offensive line was was good yesterday, and I I wrote about it in position grades that'll come out either later tonight or tomorrow. But the the offensive line, you didn't even realize they were out there at no point in the game did I say or think anything to myself about the offensive line. There were maybe like one or two snaps from Sam Hecht where you thought, okay, you know that that might be something to watch. You know, get him up a little bit, but. For the most part, like cut the guy some slack. It's his first game starting at center uh, in college football. Uh, it's not it's not a long term worry there. The offensive line was really strong, and I think we kind of expected that just because people inside the K State community understood that there was depth and talent there. Uh, but it was good for them to go out and do that and confirm what was going to happen. Now, on the flip side of things, a group that did not confirm the off-season talking points that were given about them were the receivers. Uh, and yes, you can say, well, Avery played a part of that. There was a little bit of shakiness early on there. And that, that's certainly true. Like we talked about on the pick that he threw to DJ, he had some other guys open there. But I, I said, I, I think that's a similar play where he remembers that in the Pop-Tarts Bowl last year, he got a touchdown off of checking into something, having DJ run a very similar route. Now, I think DJ was more on the inside in this scenario than he was uh, in Orlando last year. But I think that was just kind of one of those where, and that's it's. I think it's a young quarterback mistake where you say, oh, "This worked before. I'm going to do this," as a as opposed to kind of recognizing the actual situation. Outside of that, though, the receivers didn't give K State a whole lot. Jace Brown deserves credit for pretty much being Jace Brown and, and kind of giving what he expected last year, but. Keegan Johnson was a no-show, very similar to a lot of games last year where you're just kind of like, has he even been in the game? And then Dante Cephas didn't even get a catch in the game, uh, and all the other guys are still kind of working around. Trey Spivey had a nice grab uh, and and made some something happen. on. I think that ends up being the drive that gives up a pick or maybe it led to one of the field goals. Uh, what were your takeaways from the receivers, fan? Yeah, I, I would agree I, <clears throat> that there was – you know, you're still wanting more definitely after that game. Um, you know, Jace Brown had the, the big catch, and uh, Spivey was a nice grab. I think that was an RPO play even. Um, but then you didn't have much. Um, I, You know, some of that, you know, I will give <clears throat> UT Martin a little bit of credit. Probably their best two defensive players were their corners. Uh, one of them was maybe a FCS All-American this year in the, the Baker kid. But um, – you would you would hope you'd get some more separation in some of those pass plays where where K State didn't have didn't seem to have guys open. There was a few times, you know, I think that we did have some guys open that that Avery might have missed. But I think for the most part, uh, there were just there were not guys open for him to find on a lot of those. And I, you know, it's hard to tell watching live or even on the replay what kind of coverages they were in, and and how much they were playing coverage and not bringing trying to bring pressure, which I don't. You know, they had a brand pretty much a brand new defensive line this year. So I, I do think uh part of their game plan was probably to try to take away Avery Johnson running the ball and then to make him throw into zone coverages and and not 
guys that were open. So there's there's a mixed bag. But you 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 know after the hype of Keegan Johnson, you would hope something a big player too would have come out of that, and, and we didn't see that really. So um, hopefully we'll see more next week, and and you know some of that maybe game game plan dictated as well. Drew, I'll, I'll I'll throw this question to you then. So fan brings up you know, breaking in a new defensive line for UT Martin, probably helping them out with some of the coverage and, and taking certain things away. It led to K-State having a really good night running the football. I mean, they end 283 yards on the ground, 9.1 per carry. Um, and then, I mean, the starters were were better than that uh, when you factor in Giddens, Edwards, and Johnson together. Do you think that – if K State had just pounded the run all night long, we're not talking about the sluggish start like we are with you know, punt, touchdown, pick, punt, and then field yeah. goals. Because there is a real scenario where K State could have just gone out there and Avery Johnson doesn't have to throw the ball more than like three times in the first four drives of the game. You can run him nonstop. You can run Giddens nonstop. You can run Edwards nonstop and just keep pounding it. Because once they once they decided to go to that a little bit more consistently and say, okay, we they probably realized what was going on with the passing situation and they either saw what they were looking to see or they said, hey, it, we know what they're doing. It's This really does us no good to keep trying to throw in these scenarios. Let's just let it go. We saw the run game take off. Yeah, I, I 100% think that if they would have just pounded the rock from the start, you're probably getting that 63 to 6 final and everybody is like, woo. But like they they obviously wanted to work on the passing game and they kind of saw what they needed to see. And I, I think that it was uh, Chris Kleiman afterwards was kind of talking about that UT Martin did a little bit more defensively than they were anticipating <laughs> going into the game. Uh, so I wonder if that had to do with some of the coverages that they were in. But yeah, they. I, I don't think it's crazy to say that if they really wanted to from the jump, K-State probably could have ran for 425 yards at minimum yesterday. Yeah. Uh, fan, only four touches in the first half for Dylan Edwards. I came into halftime thinking they should have given him more, especially considering – you saw the offense. It was it was slow and ugly early going there. Uh, what did you make of how they utilized Dylan Edwards? And then off the back of that, how they still balance getting DJ Giddens the opportunity to go out and be DJ Giddens, which is one of the best backs in the Big Twelve. Yeah, it's, that's a it's a good point. Um, you know, they got Edwards the ball on the first play of the game on that little kind of swing pass, and then. Uh, his first run didn't come until the third drive, and then it was kind of back to back, a couple back to back, very good runs, um, and then then it was more mixing DJ and and Edwards. I I thought it was a kind of what I expected. I think he ended up with five rushes and then you know several catches, including the touchdown um, in the third quarter or beginning of the fourth quarter. So um, it'll be interesting to see how they continue to sprinkle that in. You know, we I think we saw DJ and Dylan in the backfield twice or three times uh, during the game. And then we saw them both on the field another couple times. One of them was the Edwards jet sweep out of a doubles formation. So you, you saw those two on the field five or six times. And then, then you saw Edwards in the backfield running the ball another four or five times. Then you saw him, you know, a couple other other situations. So that is going to be one of the questions is, you know, he's obviously one of your most dynamic playmakers, and, and you saw that. You saw the burst. You saw that talent very clear, I thought, on several of those runs he had. And the, um, the touchdown, he's wide open. So that wasn't really a factor of him making a great burst play. But um, that'll be interesting to see. Um, the other thing that's interesting that's going to be interesting is I, I do think specifically in the run game, if they had ran – design runs for every Johnson five times in the first half. It's 30 points at halftime for K-State. Yeah. Just because he's that special. I understand why they want to protect him, but that's going to be the other thing that's going to be the balance. I think uh I don't, you know, I, I'm I'm assuming this is game plan oriented. I don't want to see Avery Johnson run the ball 15 times a game, but I think it needs to be five to eight. 
design runs and then two to two to three scrambles maybe um because you saw the one design run on a a read play zone read to, in the first sec, second half was wide open and it, it was and that and there were several times where we gave the ball in the zone and we had the same blocking scheme on the read where he could have done the same thing and probably got even bigger plays multiple times so that is going to be something I think we do see more as the competition ramps up. Yeah, and that that feels like one too where they early on, well, the first half I don't think there was a single design run no, there was for not. him. No. And then the they come out in the second half and it felt like okay, it's time to, yeah. you know, first go play. for it. And, yeah. and that's where again I absolutely get what they were trying to do uh in the first half and and maybe it's maybe they they knew what they wanted to do. They said maybe we put ourselves in a slightly challenging position, but we're comfortable because of this defense. And let's not use that in the first. Like let's really challenge. It's it almost feels like and I don't think they meant it as disrespect to UT Martin, but it feels like they tried playing the first half with their hand tied behind their back just to see how could we do this, how will it look, how do these guys go at, about it. And what they found out was, okay, we're not as good with our, you know, C game as we need to be right now. I think I think that's probably the biggest takeaway from that is this team right now is not ready to go to Oklahoma State on a Friday night and win that game if you don't play a B or an A game, which is what K State found out last year. And I think I think this team can get there, but I think that's where they were. Whereas in the second half, Seems like they came out and they said, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna go to a couple more things. We're gonna do it." And that's another one where, like, just personal preference on my end, uh, you don't have to do it seven times in the first half, but two or three design runs for Avery Johnson drastically changed the way that thing feels. Getting Dylan Edwards a few more touches, giving DJ Giddens the ball on first down as opposed to, "Hey, we just had a first down incompletion to start the series." Uh, we're going to give you just a safe run, try and get through a hole in the middle, and then it was a two-yard gain, and then you're you're behind the sticks already. Um, that's where I think that there was a little bit of iffiness and, and why maybe I, I question a little bit about how Connor Riley handled the game. But then on the flip side, I mean, you talked about it with the Dylan Edwards touchdown, but he schemed up two wide-open, easy touchdowns to Braden Lofton and Dylan Edwards in the game. Uh, and in the second half, I mean, K-State, they got it moving pretty well. And, and it's not like, again, too, the, you know, the Will Howard pick last year against SEMO, it was it was a three-yard drive and then a pick. K-State had driven the ball like 60 yards on the Avery interception. So they moved the ball still last night, and the yardage totals up to that. So um, there just it, there's a lot of nuance involved. Uh, I think, you know, you want to see a better performance out of Avery Johnson against Tulane, and I kind of assume that we do get that. Uh, because I think he'll be better prepared for it. And also, I think you're going to see a degree higher of what the K-State offense will actually look like this year. I'm still not certain that they're going to show the full K-State offense in that game against Tulane unless you know it's late third quarter and it's a one-score game or something. Uh, final thing about the offense here, and then we'll move on to the, the unit that really showed up last night, talk defense. Any concern to make you move off of how you guys felt about Avery Johnson uh, and what he can do, at least for the early part of this season after seeing his performance last night. Drew, you can go first. No. <laughs> like, uh, I I think that he is a special talent. And is his first start at home, it, it'll be fine. I, I feel like a lot of it was just kind of nerves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I thought he was amped up. I thought we saw that on a few of those throws that were a little bit long. So um, I think that's something – I mean, that's his second – really second game playing quarterback and not just running the ball like he did against Texas Tech last year. So um, there's there's going to be that that transition to getting the touch and feel of, of throwing the ball well that will be a, a work in progress as the season goes along. And we're going to see some – Really dynamic, great throws as as the as the year goes on. Well, and and he still he still made some good ones last time. I mean, yeah. you can look at some of the and not necessarily the the deep ball to to Jace Brown because that was still maybe he could have reined it in a little bit tighter and and 
made it be a touchdown instead of setting the ball up at the one yard line. But he had some other throws that you were like, okay, he's he's got this figured out. Um, I would just maybe suggest find find a way to keep the hands a little bit drier. Like my <laughs> hands were sweating last night on the field holding the camera uh, and trying, you know, having to wipe them and everything. So trying to throw a football, which by the way, I did do twice last night. I got two throws in uh to to the ball boys for k-state drew saw one of them uh which yeah, i, I think also came got one on the, which one of those came on the deep shot to cephas which we were right there in front of uh that didn't connect and, and drew backed out of the way and i just kind of stood there and took it uh and drew was like yeah i was getting out of the way of that and uh so we're going to teach him how to stay in the pocket for for some of those but uh drew knows this I live for being on the field and getting that rogue ball to bounce my way and let me throw. It's like when I was umpiring baseball and it's like, you got to throw one back to the, uh, to the pitcher. I, that was, that's what I wanted. I'm not giving it to the catcher to throw it back to him. I, I want to be able to throw a ball. I'm out here for two hours. Let me throw a ball to you. So uh, I enjoyed getting to do that. And, but I did think at one point I was like, man, if I, if, if I don't have good enough grip on this, I am slamming Neil Jones from KCTV5 in the side of the head with this football. Uh, and fortunately, I didn't. So uh, that's good news for myself and for Neil Jones. So shout out to him. Uh, let's move on to the defense here. Number one, the secondary, I was trying to come up with stuff to talk about for position grades today. And normally the corners and safeties, they are in a group all of their own. Um, I put them together today because they didn't really have anything to do last night. <laughs> I mean, you could maybe, I guess, nitpick and say that the, the secondary could have done a better job of not getting lost and getting burnt on the, the big play when Toby Austin saw me didn't wrap up and finish the sack. Uh, but that kind of feels like nitpicking and that's just one play. So I don't know that we need to talk about those guys because I don't think it does anything, but Everybody else that would be grouped into what is traditionally the front seven, but we know how football has changed. Linebackers and defensive line, very impressive last night. Who stood out the most of that group, though? Because Toby and Des Purnell both had big nights and probably were pretty in your face with their performance. But which one do you think had the more significant night is the word I'll use? I'm going to go with Toby just because every time – he was on the field, which was mainly third downs. He seemed to be getting to the quarterback and at least putting pressure on the quarterback and, and making him move in the pocket. So I was very – I mean, you kind of expect it from Des Mel because he's been around and he's, you know, he's a very good player and led the team in tackles and had a, a one-and-a-half tackles for loss. So that was impressive. But the, the sack – one-and-a-half sacks, although I don't know why it wasn't just two. I don't know where the half sack came from for Toby. But I was super impressed with his ability to get off the edge and, and, and wreak havoc in the backfield. Yeah, I would also go Toby. It it was very close on uh, when I do players of the game on who I decided to go with. But Toby had probably more of the splash plays uh, because getting to the quarterback is a lot of fun. And when you have a celebration like that, it's also a lot of fun. <laughs> Uh, and, and like going back and just like thinking of how last night went, I can't remember like a UT Martin player like actually blocking Toby. Yeah. Like it seemed like he had his way with the tackle. And, and the one time that I think that he might have gotten blocked a little bit was because a tight end came all the way over from the opposite side to uh, to block him. So. He was a he was a force last night, and it, it was fun to see. And it was kind of like the the hype that we had kind of heard about the defensive ends going to coming from the coaches all off season and during training camp. That you really got to see it, and they were very very dominant. And, and I'm interested to see how it goes for uh, this next week because you're probably playing a better offensive line, but. It was good to see constant pressure throughout the game because I know that that's one thing that Mason was harping on last season about uh, the K-State defensive ends. And and obviously, Toby played a, a large role in that. But I also want to point out that the very first play of the game, Cody Stuffelbean got in the face of Kincaid Dent, and he had that deep ball down the field, which you know the UT Martin receiver had his hands on. He pretty much had VJ Payne beat, uh, but... 
because Dent had Stuffle being in his face, he wasn't able to get it 100% the way he needed to, and that's what affected that throw in my eye. So that was the kind of thing that I thought was noticeable. Obviously, Toby Austin saw me stood out, and then in addition to that, Brendan Mott got back there last night. I thought he looked more like the 2022 version than 2023, and that probably has a lot to do with the fact that he had another running mate on the edge uh, last night. Now, I will say this. Des Purnell was so good last night that I don't even remember any other linebacker doing anything in the game. He pretty much just said, I'm going to make plays for the three of us that are out here. Uh, and you go and look at what the final stats ended up being for UT Martin, but they end up running the ball for only 36 yards. And it seems like there were probably three or four tackles that Des Purnell made in the game that were either for a loss or stopped like and made it a one or two yard gain. That if he doesn't make that, then UT Martin is probably going for 10, 15 yards on, on the play and getting the first down. That's how good he was last night. And while I, I, K-State needs edge guys like what Toby Austin Sonmi did, uh, and I think that long-term might be the most impactful, Des Prunell came out last night and played and showed that flash. It was like, that is an all-Big 12 linebacker right there because he made the game-changing plays that we talked about. I think, you know, going on with Scott Wildcat and asking who who will be the defensive MVP this year, I think I took Marquis Siegel, but like Des Purnell would be the guy that you would kind of profile as being able to go out there and take a game over defensively, and he did that last night. So that was really, really good to see, uh, and the K-State defense as a whole was – was fantastic. Uh, another player that I'll add that, I mean, it, he wasn't a guy that was probably in like that top two, but a guy that really kind of flashed to me that uh, we talked about on the field last night during the third quarter. Mace was Ryan Davis. Yes. Uh, Ryan Davis caused some havoc getting to the quarterback uh, off the edge, uh, which was nice to see. And it, it really looks like that 2023 class of defensive ends is a, a legitimate uh grand slam that k-state hit because chidi obi Iser also made a really impressive play on a reverse uh jordan mm -hmm. allen got some run last night so i i think that the the defensive ends i there was not a drop off when other guys would come on the field and, and i think that keeping those guys fresh will be really big during the season and i i think that they could have a, a pretty big day uh saturday and i i I think that I'm fully bought in uh, to the defensive end room. Yeah, they were they 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 showed out and had a good time. Uh, moving on, special teams for K State. We thought maybe there would be a big kind of return to greatness there. They did score a special teams touchdown on Saturday. It was a blocked punt though, which is actually you you know you think about it, that's been kind of climbing specialty at K State. It feels like they get at least one of those a season and they've been really good at identifying the moments to be aggressive and to not be aggressive on those Ty Bowman got in there and led to Colby McAllister picking it up for the touchdown. Uh, what were your overall takeaways from special teams yesterday fan? Because the block punt for a touchdown was great. Chris Tennant banged home two 40 plus yarders with ease, but everything else to me came across as questionable. Yeah, I, I, you know, you, I've mentioned before, you never want to see a fumble on a kickoff return or a return of any type. And that always puts a damper because you basically give up a possession when you do that. Um, I, I, you know, I thought McClannon punted the ball okay. I think there, he had one kind of suspect punt, but he averaged 41 and had two inside the 20. So, you know, he didn't have to punt it a ton, but. You know that that was nice to see because that's that's a new guy out there. Tenants two field goals, both over forty yards, were were nice. A um, couple decent punt returns, nothing spectacular. Um, you know, I, I was I'm always disappointed when a punt returner doesn't field the ball and you lose twenty yards on the bounce. And and we saw that the one time with Dylan Edwards, so that would be my other knock. So the two biggest knocks really are that that fumble and that missed punt return. Um, and I and I do think we there's some some playmaking ability. I I, I thought up until he fumbled, Jace Brown ha was having a very nice kickoff return. Um, but he, in in the the sad thing is he kind of ran into his own guy. It wasn't even a forced fumble by the defense. He ran into his own guy and kind of dropped it. So, um, but it, I liked his patience and the way he, he was falling 
a, a well set up kickoff return before that that fumble happened. So I think overall, you know that <clears throat> that leads a damper, but in some ways, sometimes a fumble like that is kind of fluky unless you see it happen yeah. again. And so I, you know, special teams had some good things. I think overall. Yeah, I'd say that it was a mixed bag. Like Tenet was good kicking. The one kickoff out of bounds, yeah, it was about I forgot about it, that. It, it, yeah. It was but it was about this close really for me. Close. The perfect kick. Drew was trying to argue from the back of that end zone that uh <laughs> I don't know Is that he's like, I don't know, that looked close. I was like, it was close, but I think it probably was out. But so it was like this close for a perfect kick, yeah. and that's just what they were trying to do there. Well, what the difference between a, a perfect kick and a, a almost perfect kick is fifteen yards. So I think it's only ten now. Not only ten. Oh yeah. Well, I, I guess that's right because we've talked in the past about how it's kind of devalued. You should just yeah. yeah, you should just do it every time. So yeah, that's a good point. So like, that was fine. The, the long kick return was good until Jace Brown fumbled. Blocking punts is always fun. There was no like real stress on any of the kicks either that I, I thought, at least a few goals. Like, I, I, I was pretty confident every time that he was out there. Uh, the other thing that just kind of like occurred to me is, you know, we're talking about how the game went and everything. Nobody, or like we haven't really mentioned that K-State loses the turnover battle to nothing and, and still cruises to a 41 to six win. So yeah. When you can play your C plus game, lose a turnover battle two to nothing, and still win by thirty five, I, I think you're going to be okay. Well, it would have been nice if uh, Kincaid Dent could have thrown the ball more than fourteen times to <laughs> at least give Siegel a chance to show the world that the hands have been soaked in you know lotion all off season and they're softer <laughs> now. So but that was a little disappointing. He, he did fumble once, and UT Martin got it back. So, like, sometimes turnovers can be a little bit fluky like well, that. And, and that's a shout-out to another defensive end, and Travis Bates, who I thought uh, played played a fine game. He he helped force that fumble, and then he just looked the part out there, too. Uh, so that was significant. All right, moving on now as we hit the home stretch of the show. Tulane due up for K-State this weekend. What do we make of K-State going down to New Orleans to face the Green Wave 11 a.m. kick on ESPN? Uh, Tulane ended up maybe surprising some people with Ty Thompson not being their starting quarterback, and he didn't even appear to be the number two quarterback with how they rotated QBs in their season opening win, which, by the way, uh, they did not play anybody special to open up the year. They played Southeast Louisiana, who it would be – one of those teams that I'd say, Gene, get the Lions on the phone and try to find they, a way to get them to come to Manhattan. And Tulane still struggled in the first half. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, three and eight last year for Southeast Louisiana. If anybody was wondering how uh, they played a season ago, Tulane ended up winning 52 to nothing. So I'll start by this, uh, and then you can give us what you got on the green wave. Am I wrong to be? I mean, obviously, we knew Tulane was not going to be as good as they were in 2022. They weren't going to be as good as they were last year because they lost Willie Fritz. They lost Michael Pratt. They've, they've lost a lot of guys. But after the way that they played, I'm more certain of K-State going down to New Orleans and taking care of business. I'm not saying that K-State cruises and wins by three touchdowns or whatever, but I think K-State and K-State fans will be comfortable for most of the game here, because I just don't think Tulane is all that good. And maybe part of that has to do with the fact that Ty Thompson didn't win the starting quarterback job. The guy that transferred from Oregon should have all the talent in the world. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I kind of feel the same way. I mean, I think K-State fans will be leery just because of what happened a couple of years ago, but this is not a completely different team. Um, doesn't have the the depth especially on the defensive side of the ball. I think that's, you know, even though they shut Southeast Louisiana out and handled them, um, they lost a ton on their defense, which has been their strength under Willie Fritz um, when he had his really good two years at Tulane the last couple of seasons. Um, so so I think that's, that's a better matchup that K-State's not facing some vaunted defense, and I think our defense should be fine against what was, you know, they put up some points, but, when it was 14 nothing right before halftime, Southeast Louisiana was driving. I mean, inside mm -hmm. the 20th, threw a pick, 100-yard interception return for a touchdown 
to make it 21 nothing at halftime. So um, it was pretty close, although, you know, our game was too. So I'm sure their fans are saying the same thing about us. Yeah, although Tulane, uh, they got the fortunate part in the first half of Southeast Louisiana missed a field goal and threw a pick six. So, I mean, that's yeah. 10 points right there. It could have been 14 to 10 at halftime. Uh, and then they Mensa played until they gave, they got to uh, thir- 42 points, and then they – Sent in the uh, the reserves. Yeah, the thing about Tulane though, you're gonna have to stop the run. Makai Hughes mm-hmm. is a stud, but I'm not overly concerned about any of the quarterbacks that Tulane has. Like I think that they're all pretty good to average, and on the outside, nobody really like scares me a ton. I and mean, Mario Williams had a huge game at Southeast Louisiana, but. I mean, that that doesn't really scare me a, a whole lot with how good K State secondary is and should be. Uh, but you do worry just because it's the first road game of the season. It's Avery Johnson's first road start. It's Connor Riley's first time calling plays on the road. But I, I would say too that I was not overly like impressed with how Tulane played in a fifty-two to nothing game like that. It feels very similar to how K State played, to be completely honest. Of like they probably played their C plus game and also won fifty two to nothing because they played one of the worst FCS teams. Yeah, I it, I don't know. I just I I feel better about K State going down there, and I also this is the way that, and maybe this is just having twenty four hours to to digest how last night played out now. But when you start to to reason through why things may have looked the way they did. Like uh, Avery Johnson's play should not be excused and just written off. Like he needs to be better and kind of show that he can be better against Tulane. But we also know that there was a deliberate way that K-State was going out to start that game. It's pretty evident uh, by the way things played out in the first half versus the second half. And I think that they'll be ready to, like I said earlier, go out there and kind of open this thing up a little bit more and be more true to themselves uh, when that game kicks off down in New Orleans on Saturday. So we'll see how it ends up working out. Uh, any other thoughts on Tulane before we move on with Big 12 scoreboard and finish out the show? Uh, it's strange to be playing the same coach at two different group of five <laughs> programs. Yeah, in back-to-back True. years. Yeah. Yeah, second very strange. Second week of the season, too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what carryover there is from Troy to Tulane uh, this season. So we'll uh, get to see that next weekend down at Ullman Stadium uh, in New Orleans. All right, time to look around the Big Twelve and take a peek at everything else that's going on uh, around the league. And it got started early last week, Thursday and Friday finals, right there for you. UCF slow start, uh, but they ended up beating New Hampshire fifty-seven to three again. New Hampshire. Get your butts to Manhattan, Kansas. No more of these Missouri Valley football <laughs> conference teams or uh, you know Ohio Valley or whatever. Get, give me New Hampshire. KU takes down Lindenwood 48-3. to Actually, uh, they've got to be in some conference nearby. Give, give me whatever they are. Uh, Colorado 31-26 win over North Dakota State. Utah blew by Southern Utah 49 to nothing, And then TCU – got a win over the ACC for the Big 12 as the ACC's just horrendous start to the college football season continued. Uh, TCU wins 34-27 to right there. From the early games on Thursday and Friday last week, what were your guys' most notable takeaways? I, I was <clears> – <throat> I, I thought Colorado would probably win that game, but that was a tight game most of the time and, and you know, I, I, I kind of agree with D.Y. Don't play at FCS. For sure, don't play FCS schools with Dakota in their name. Like, yeah. just don't do it. Um, and and they they definitely pushed them. And, you know, Colorado's defense still looks pretty suspect because I don't think that North Dakota State deep offense is that good. And they were able to move the ball pretty well on Colorado. So I think that, that one probably stands out. I, TCU going to Stanford is – is a nice win, but it's a seven point win over a team that's ranked in the eighties and most of the preseason metrics. So Stanford is not a good football program right now. So 
TCU's got to be happy they won, but that's not a very impressive win over what is not is probably one of the worst power four teams in the country. Yeah, I probably feel worse about TCU than I did to start the season. And I didn't think that they were going to be any good to begin with, but struggling at Stanford in front of 20 fans, probably not a good sign for how their season is going to go. Yeah. Could you imagine uh, starting your season on a Friday at Stanford and struggling in front of nobody in the stands? Who would, well, what big least, golf team would ever do that that works? <laughs> at, at least Christian McCaffrey was on the other side. Uh, that's true. That is, that is uh, one very notable difference about, about that situation. Uh, then, uh, yeah, Colorado is another one where they, they won, but again, I kind of feel gross about how they played and they needed some help from, uh, some suspect officiating on that last drive. Uh, apparently targeting doesn't exist anymore, uh, on that last possession. And then, uh, Lindenwood. Who would win between, yeah, Lindenwood and like Emporia State? Does Emporia State win that? Uh, Probably. I mean, there's a lot of D2 schools that I think uh, Bill Connolly said would uh, take care of Lindenwood. Lindenwood was ranked 106 in Bill Connolly's FCS preseason rankings. (laughs) And and then, uh, not good. (laughs) <laughs> Utah and Southern Utah. I didn't even look at anything from that game because there's nothing to take away. Uh, yeah, you know, Utah kind of got out to a, a slower start in that one. Just it wasn't like instant points Probably on their face. Cam Rising is our age and is still playing. Yeah, he's a little rickety. Uh, but the, he eventually got it going. He 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 ended ten of fifteen for five touchdowns. Uh, which is funny that half of the, the completions in the game were touchdowns for him. Uh, my favorite play, though, was watching their one of their running backs try to uh, set up a block, which I think ended up leading to a big – actually a touchdown, like their second or third touchdown of the game. But instead of just, like, engaging with the guy, he just leaps straight into the air and kind of – it was almost like he was trying to give the dude, like, a flying kick to the face, and it worked. It was a very successful block for him. That's all I saw from that game. Um, Utah, Utah is fine. Moving on to the first wave of games on Saturday and the uh, final scores that end up accompanying them. Uh, Oklahoma State, the most impressive performance in the Big 12 this weekend, even though it was against an FCS opponent, it was the reigning FCS national champs who were uh, certainly a popular pick to cover, but O State came out and blasted them 44-20, to and that's a scenario where Oklahoma State is typically struggles with their non-con schedule. Uh, Penn State took care of West Virginia 34-12. to We can all stop acting like West Virginia is good at John Kurtz. Cincinnati 38-20 to win over Towson. Iowa State, boy, you, you thought K-State sucked 41-6 to over uh, UT Martin. What are they saying in Ames about a 21-3 to win over North Dakota? Uh, Baylor beats Tarleton State 45 to 3. That's notable just because Baylor came out and, and took care of business, uh, even though not a great opponent. But that's that's a step in the right direction for Dave Aranda and, and company. And then maybe the worst weekend out of anybody, UNLV beating Houston 27 to 7, pretty much tells us that Willie Fritz has an even longer road to get Houston back to a competitive level. Uh, than what I anticipated going into the season. So out of the first wave of games there, what do you guys make of it? Uh, I would say even though Houston lost that bad, I still think that one Big 12 team had a worse weekend than they did. Uh, Iowa State barely beating North Dakota. like That is pretty uninspiring. Still not the team that I think did the worst uh Cincinnati only beating Towson by 18 also kind of shows where they're at Oklahoma State though very impressive yeah that I, I'm that Houston score um you know V's was ranked in the 80s in the preseason metrics by about everybody and I mean Houston was in the 70s and 60s so but I still thought Houston would would with Willie Fritz coaching would would probably win that game. I did not think it would be a loss. And then to lose really 
in a game that was never close, 27 to seven, and it wasn't even that close. So um, that that one surprised me probably the most of all those early scores. Um, I I'm I was I would say I was not a West Virginia believer, but I thought they might compete a little bit better. But I I was probably most impressed with Andy Kodalecki bringing Making. that offense. And making Drew Aller look like a good quarterback. Penn State look like a dynamic offense. Yeah, I I think that's that's probably the better takeaway. I mean, I mean West Virginia tried to hang in there for a little bit, but then I mean just idiotic breakdown before the half, and then they came out. I mean, after that long weather delay and yeah. very uninspired. I I would say honestly, uh, in addition to Oklahoma State having the more impressive weekend. Um, I know who Drew is going to say had the worst weekend in the Big 12, and it's probably a team that won a game because the second wave of games on Saturday night, there ends up being a little bit more fascination with the results than what would have been anticipated for really a lot of these games. I, I think K-State and UT Martins may be the only one that really didn't have anything too notable in, but you look, Texas Tech needs overtime to beat Abilene Christian, and they probably get helped out just by the fact that Abilene Christian said, hey, we're going to go for the win here. BYU blowing out Southern Illinois, I don't know that it changes a ton about what we think about BYU, but it certainly makes you think a little bit that maybe they'll be closer to like that five to six win range than two to three. And then Arizona, a little shaky on the offensive side, 61 to 39 win, or the defensive side, 61 39 win over New Mexico. And then Arizona State might have had the second best weekend in the big 12, because for what we're saying about Willie Fritz and Houston being further away, them coming out and blasting Wyoming like that does not mean that Arizona state is going to be a good team this season, but it might signal to some, look, I've been a little bit higher on Arizona state this off season than all you other haters, but they might be closer to getting there quicker than what would have been uh, imagined previously. Cause a 48 to seven win against Wyoming is impressive considering their struggles in other games last season. So second wave of games, what are the big takeaways from those? And uh, Fan, you can lead us off here. Texas Tech um, should have lost to Abilene Christian. And, uh, I mean, had a had a pretty good lead early in that game and then just let it – gave it away. And Abilene Christian had a chance to win at the end of the game and then went for, for two – which I think is probably the right decision to, to try to win it at the end. Um, so I, I would, I still think Houston was a little bit worse, but Texas Tech is a close second as far as their worst weekend in the Big 12, in, even in a win. Um, um, and then the BYU score surprised me. I mean, Southern Illinois is a top 10 FCS team, not probably not quite as good as the, Dakota State schools that we saw, but uh, that's a solid team. And to put them away like that, whereas Colorado won, only won by five to, to a team that's probably pretty similar, was a pretty impressive showing by BYU. Not what I expected. Yeah, I, I'm still going to say that Texas Tech had the worst weekend. I and mean, if, <laughs> if you're allowing 615 yards of offense to Abilene Christian, you might be in trouble the rest of the season. Uh, Arizona State, though, second most impressive win of the weekend. I was one of the haters. I was one of the doubters. I have them on our, our team list, and I was one of the, the main doubters. <laughs> uh, Arizona, though, if they if they can't fix their defense, they could also be in, pay, on, or in trouble the rest of the way. Uh, but McMillan is an absolute stud mm -hmm. and showed that last night. Yeah, it's going to make things real fascinating for K-State and Arizona uh a week from this coming friday when week three they meet up because you're in such a a unique spot now with how you you assess that game with what we saw k-state's defense perform like but then also some shakiness on k-state's offense which you thought hey you're going to need that to be ready for that game especially knowing what arizona can do scoring points but their defense gives you some pause elsewhere so uh, that'll be a fun and matchup then, and a good feeling out process 
I was also going to say, and too, like this week we learned essentially nothing about Arizona since they're playing Northern Arizona. Like unless they yeah. can't stop Northern Arizona again, like we we learned nothing about Arizona from that game either. Yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be an interesting one. Week two, just to run over it for people uh, in the Big Twelve and the way that it looks coming up. Uh, one game on Friday, BYU will go to SMU. That will be a good kind of test and interesting one for BYU because we just saw SMU go on the road in week zero and struggle with Nevada. Uh, so that might change the calculus on what BYU could do in that game uh, in Dallas. And then Saturday, K-State and Tulane go at 11 a.m. Arkansas at Oklahoma State uh, at 11 as well. Pitt at Cincinnati. Cincinnati won that game at Pitt last year. A conference, non-conference game. Baylor is at Utah and then the Cyhawk game, Iowa State at Iowa at 2.30 on CBS. West Virginia will get their first one of the year. They play Albany at home. UCF, another uh, sacrificial lamb. Sam Houston goes to them. And then KU, Illinois at 6 o'clock. And another fascinating Big 12 game, Colorado at Nebraska. Uh, that'll be kind of the, the who's back bowl. And then Houston and Oklahoma. Uh, boy. You had a bad week if you were Houston. Now you get to go to Norman. And uh, there were some ups and downs for OU in their week one game against Temple, but they throttled them, and that probably won't go very well. And then the last handful of games, late kicks in the Big 12. 7 o'clock TCU, they play in FCS, nobody, Long Island, uh, who I believe Baylor played last year or two years ago. Uh, yep. Northern Arizona, Arizona at 9 Texas Tech on the road in Pullman at Wazoo at 9 o'clock. And then Arizona State, Big 12 after dark is alive and well. They kick at 9.30 against Mississippi State uh, in Sun Devil Stadium. Or I guess now they've got a naming rights sponsor, but it will always be Sun Devil Stadium to me. So that's what the Big 12 looks like this week. Non-K-State Tulane, what is your guys' game you're most looking forward to in the Big 12 this weekend? Drew, you are up first. I'm going to say a game that I was just kind of crapping on the, the team that was playing in it. Texas Tech and Washington State. Washington State scored a lot of points yesterday against uh, Portland State. So, I mean, take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. But if Texas Tech can't stop a nosebleed, it, it could be rough. And, and Washington State's been known for putting up points. And, and I, I think that that's kind of a fascinating game because – Texas Tech was kind of a team that we all kind of pointed out that their schedule is very fav favorable and could start like that 6-0, 6-1. Oh, and one. So if they can't win this game, it really changes how I feel about Texas Tech the rest of the way. I, I think that BYU-SMU game was intriguing just to see because BYU is not a team I had uh, much stock in going into the season. I, I had them in my bottom five in the Big 12. They could still end up there, but if they go on the road and beat SMU, that would be something that I would pay a little more attention to, especially after what they did to uh, what I think is a pretty good Southern Illinois team to 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 start the season. Yeah, uh, we all had BYU either 14th or 15th in the Big 12 in our uh, first wave of power rankings this past week. But now you think about it, uh, you you might start to say, they're better than Cincinnati. They're better than Houston. You know, are they better than some of these other on here? It'll be interesting to follow along with BYU. To me, there are a lot of kind of just fun matchups. I don't know that they're all that any of them are great, but they're fun. Um, Iowa State, Iowa will certainly be fascinating. If Iowa State wins that game, I will take them a lot more seriously than you know I already do. I I, I have respect for them. I think that they're a top seven-ish team in the Big 12 right now, but if they go and win that game in Kinnick, then I start to think, hey, maybe they're uh, the real deal. I think for me, the one that I'm most intrigued about is Colorado and Nebraska. Um, mm. I think to, it's always fun to watch those teams play. Again, you know, when they started playing each other again a couple of weeks ago or a couple of years ago, I really enjoyed that. But now you think going into this week uh, and what it kind of means, Dylan Rayola looked good in the start for Nebraska and Colorado, what ends up happening. This is kind of a you know a win-win situation for K-State fans. You either get to hate on Deion Sanders in Colorado or you get to hate on Nebraska for uh, you know not being back. This is a game Nebraska should win, considering what we know about both teams. But 
uh, that'll be fascinating. So I'm very much interested in that. And the Big 12 gets uh, good billing for some of their games this week. Uh, Oklahoma State and Arkansas go at 11 on ABC. Baylor and Utah is 2.30 on Fox. Iowa State and Iowa, 2.30 on CBS. And then Colorado, Nebraska, 6.30 on NBC. Uh, so a lot of network TV. And 9 o'clock, Tech, uh, Texas Tech and Washington State on Fox. So a lot of uh, broadcast TV for the Big 12 this week. And uh, we'll see how it goes. But that will do it for us. We'll get out of here in the Sunday show. And we'll be back tomorrow. D.Y. and I will recap what Chris Kleiman had to say at his second in-season press conference of the season, reflecting a little bit deeper on the win over UT Martin and getting ready to face Tulane for the second time in three years as the Cats look for some revenge after the 2022 loss. So for Drew Galloway and KSU fan, I'm Mason Voth. Thanks for listening to the KSO Show. We are back again on Monday and always on over at On3 and KStateOnline.com.